In the Battle of Britain, there were 35 Hurricane squadrons compared to just 19 of Spitfires. The Hurricane outnumbered the Spitfire almost 2 to 1, and it cost less than a third of the price of a Spitfire to build. But as our closely run poll shows, it was the Spitfire that really captured the nation's hearts. A little known fact about the Spitfire though, is that the first aircraft it ever shot down was a Hawker Hurricane. The Battle of Barking Creek World War II began just 67 hours ago, and above the searchlight station at Mersey Island is the unmistakable drone of aircraft engines. With no friendly aircraft expected, and a thick layer of fog obscuring their vision, the men report the mystery aircraft up the chain of command. Their message arrives at RAF Uxbridge, headquarters of Fighter Command's 11 Group. In an underground bunker is the operations room, where despite the early hour, there's a hive of activity. Reports about the unidentified aircraft are also arriving from radar stations. With the war beginning just three days earlier, and tensions running extremely high, the RAF order a significant response. At 6.30am, just 15 minutes after the aircraft was first sighted, 151 Squadron based at RAF North Weald were scrambled. Led by Squadron Leader Teddy Donaldson, 151 launch all 12 of their Hawker Hurricane fighters. Ten minutes later, at 0640, 56 Squadron were scrambled. Also based at North Weald, they too launched 12 Hurricanes. The Squadron are followed by two reserve aircraft, flown by pilot officers Frank Rose and Montague Holton Harrop. Just five minutes later, Spitfires joined the action when 74 Squadron launched 12 aircraft from RAF Hornchurch. This process continued until 116 aircraft were in the air, with a further 24 on standby. If that seems like an overreaction for a single unidentified aircraft, it was, and we'll find out why that happened later in the video. With so many aircraft in the air, most of them flown by nervous and inexperienced pilots, combat was perhaps inevitable, and it's 74 Squadron who see the enemy first. Like most squadrons at the time, 74 consists of 12 aircraft. The squadron is split into two flights, with each flight holding two sections. Red and yellow sections make up A flight, with blue and green sections in B flight. Leading both the squadron and A flight is Red 1, Flight Lieutenant Adolf Sailor Milan. His wingmen are Flying Officer William Measures and Sergeant Ian Hawkin. Alongside them is Yellow Section, led by Flying Officer Vincent Paddy Byrne, with Pilot Officer John Freeborn flying as Yellow 2 and Sergeant John Flinders as Yellow 3. With the enemy in sight, Milan calls over the radio, Tally Ho, Number 1 Attack, Go! With Byrne in the lead, Yellow Section dive towards a pair of stragglers separated from the main formation. The stage is now set for one of the war's great tragedies. The stragglers targeted by Yellow Section are of course the reserve aircraft from 56 Squadron flown by Frank Rose and Montague Holton Harrop. Unfortunately, in the heat of the moment, Byrne and Freeborn haven't realised the aircraft in their gun sights are in fact Hawker Hurricanes. John Freeborn fires first. His shots hit Montague Holton Harrop in the back of the head and he's killed immediately. A few seconds later, Paddy Byrne opens fire on Frank Rose's hurricane. Thankfully, Rose is unharmed and manages to crash land his aircraft in a field just outside of Ipswich. Believing that they've just scored their first victories, Yellow Section turn for home. Surging with adrenaline, Freeborn spots another enemy aircraft and immediately turns to intercept. But just before he can squeeze the trigger, John Flinders sweeps across his path, blocking the shot. For a brief moment, Freeborn is furious, but his anger soon turns to relief as he realises the enemy aircraft was in fact a friendly Bristol Blenheim. Without the awareness and quick thinking of John Flinders, this could easily have become the third friendly fire incident in less than an hour. The squadron returned to RAF Hornchurch, where the horrific truth of the situation was explained to John Freeborn and Paddy Byrne. The two men were arrested next to their Spitfires and confined to quarters. The court-martial took place the following month. Paddy Byrne and John Freeborn were represented by the vastly experienced trial lawyer and former Attorney General Sir Patrick Hastings. A second lawyer assisted in the case, an officer who would go on to become famous in their own right, Flight Lieutenant Roger Bushell. 
Interestingly, Adolf Milan, who was commanding the squadron on the day, chose not to defend his pilots, but instead he appeared to give evidence for the prosecution. This set the stage for a particularly colourful and emotive trial. Hastings and Milan went head to head in the cross-examination. Milan admitted that he gave the initial attack order, but then claimed that he'd issued a counter-order calling off the attack when he realised the aircraft were in fact friendly hurricanes. He also stated that Byrne and Freeborn had acted recklessly and irresponsibly by attacking the aircraft without first identifying them. In return, Hastings called Milan a barefaced liar and stated that not one of the squadron's pilots had heard the order to call off the attack. Despite the fireworks of the trial, the court remained objective and found Paddy Byrne and John Freeborn not guilty of any intentional wrongdoing. The Battle of Barking Creek, as the incident was later known as, was declared to be an unfortunate incident of war. This leaves two questions unanswered. Firstly, why were 116 aircraft scrambled to intercept just one single unidentified aircraft? And secondly, was Adolf Milan lying when he said he ordered his squadron to stop the attack? The first question can be answered by a fault in the chain home system that provided early warning alerts for incoming aircraft. In 1939, Chain Home consisted of 21 radar stations stretching from Scotland to Southampton. Radar stations naturally transmitted their signals forwards towards the enemy, but an unwanted side effect was that they produced smaller signals to the side and rear of the station. These signals were normally suppressed using an electrical system. Unfortunately, on the 6th of September, this system had failed in a radar station near South End. Consequently, as aircraft were scrambled, they were picked up by the chain home station making it look like there were more enemy aircraft than there really were. This triggered more aircraft to be scrambled, and the process kept repeating itself. As for the second question, well that needs a bit of guesswork to answer. At the court-martial, Milan had claimed that he ordered the attack to be stopped when he realised the targets were in fact friendlies. However, none of the squadron's pilots heard this order, prompting Hastings to call Milan a barefaced liar. It is possible, though, that Milan was in fact telling the truth. In 1939, British aircraft were fitted with a system called Pipsqueak, an early form of IFF or Identify Friend or Foe. Whilst radar could identify aircraft positions, tracks and even altitudes, Pipsqueak allowed the ground controllers to identify specific squadrons or even individual aircraft. The system worked by using the aircraft's TR.9D radio to emit a radio pulse coded to a certain frequency at a specified time interval. Pipsqueak transmitted for 14 seconds every minute, allowing each of the four sections in a squadron to identify themselves once every minute. The major drawback to the system was the radio itself. Whilst it could receive inputs from two channels at a time, one for Pipsqueak and one for the pilot's voice, it could only transmit one at a time, and it prioritised pipsqueak. If the pilot was talking into the radio when their pipsqueak started transmitting, the voice communication would be cut off. In 1939, equipment shortages meant that pipsqueak was often only fitted to the section leader's aircraft, making it highly likely that Milan had the system on his Spitfire. It's therefore entirely possible that Milan did indeed cancel the attack, but sheer bad luck and unfortunate timing meant the message was never heard. Understandably, after the court-martial, tensions between Adolf Milan and John Freeborn were strained. Both men returned to 74 Squadron, each believing the other was responsible for the so-called Battle of Barking Creek. The men were, however, able to maintain a professional relationship which would go on to create two fantastically successful careers. Adolf Milan won the Distinguished Flying Cross the following summer when he shot down five enemy aircraft during the Dunkirk evacuations. In August 1940, he was promoted to squadron leader and took command of 74 Squadron. The same month, his squadron shot down 38 enemy aircraft in one day, and two days after that, he was awarded a bar to his DFC. Milan received further promotions, and despite strict orders prohibiting senior officers from flying on operations, he continued to fly his Spitfire. Adolf Milan won a Distinguished Service Order in Bar before retiring in 1946 as a group captain, with 27 confirmed kills. John Freeborn also saw action over Dunkirk, where he shot down two enemy aircraft. But he was shot down himself whilst having a scrap with a Ju-88. 
He spent several days on the run, and at one point was spotted hiding in a church cemetery and found himself pinned down by a German machine gunner. Remarkably, he managed to reach friendly lines at Calais and was flown back to England. John Freeborn flew more operational hours in the Battle of Britain than any other pilot. He increased his tally to no less than 12 enemy aircraft, earning himself a distinguished flying cross and bar. When the United States entered the war, he taught American pilots how to fly the Spitfire, before returning to England and taking command of his own squadron. At the age of just 24, John Freeborn was promoted to become one of the RAF's youngest ever wing commanders. He left the Air Force in 1946, believing it to be run by nincompoops. When he retired, he had flown 42 different types of aircraft. The death of Montague Holton Harrop would weigh heavily on John Freeborn for the rest of his life. In his later years, he would open up, saying, I think about him nearly every day. I've had a good life, and he should have had a good life too. And finally, Paddy Byrne was shot down in 1940, where he found himself reunited with his trial lawyer, Roger Bushell, in Stalaglyph 3. Unlike Bushell, Paddy Byrne didn't get the chance to escape through the now famous tunnel. He did, however, effect a great escape of his own when he successfully bluffed German medics into thinking he'd had a mental breakdown and he was repatriated to England. Due to the nature of his escape, he was reassigned to ground duties for the rest of the war. The death of Montague Holton Harrop was without doubt a complete tragedy. With so many aircraft in the air on September 6th, most of them flown by nervous and inexperienced pilots, an accident was perhaps inevitable. His death, however, was not in vain. The so-called Battle of Barking Creek highlighted deficiencies in the early warning system, and radar would be developed to become one of the deciding factors in the Battle of Britain. If you enjoyed the video, please do the YouTube thing and smash the thumbs up button to support the channel. Make sure you're subscribed with your notifications turned on, and we'll see you for the next one.